Gracias por pressing play y welcome to Smart Chickens, a working together smarter diversity meets innovation and growth podcast. In today's episode, we have a very special guest, John Ruji, VP of Marketing Strategy at BombBomb, where he's focused on rehumanizing the way people do business through personal one-to-one -one video. And as VP of Marketing Strategy, he's leading their content team on category design, strategic messaging, positioning, and content strategy. His entrepreneurial background includes being a successful founder of Cosly, where he built the world's first SaaS platform to help SMBs generate referral, referrals using cause marketing. He oversaw all growth efforts and recruited over 6,000 SMBs to join his community, raising over $2 million for charity in the process. He built their marketing process and team from scratch. They were awarded number one place to work in Kentucky in 2016 and received recognition from Entrepreneur and Outside Magazine for having a great company culture. Cosi was then acquired by SkyFi in 2018, a cloud-based software company that helps streamline operations, drive marketing results, and improve visitor experience. And in 2018, he led their team as VP of Marketing North America um, before getting on this current role of VP of Marketing and Strategy at BombBomb. He's also the co-host of uh, a, an important and interesting B2B growth podcast show. We have a very real and candid conversation around his view around category design and its unique path to help companies differentiate themselves in an ever increasingly competitive and noisy market. He also dives into his founder journey using category design with Cosly and how he's shaping BombBomb's strategic marketing growth via the lens of category design. He gives us some of his book recommendations to get 1% better, and he shares the advice he would have give, who had given a younger John if he could go back into the future. As always, this podcast is brought to you by our good friends at digitechie.com, a conversational marketing demand gen and revenue accelerator consultancy, helping B2B companies achieve six to seven figures in pipelines consistently and scalably. And gypsyforever.com, uniquely handmade wellness products that help you connect your mind, body, and soul to achieve a better balance too. So vamos, let's dive into the show. And without further ado, here's John. Uh, able to make some time for me. I'm excited to, uh, to speak with you a little bit about category design, a little bit about your origin story and background. Um, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure to, to, uh, to speak with you in, in LinkedIn informally a little bit, as well as with Ethan, um, youth at, uh, at a, you know, private community, peak community that we're part of. So I'm, I'm excited. Um, so, uh, congratulations on what you did with Costly and getting it, you know, acquired. And then you sat with, um, how do you say that? The, the name of that, was it SkyFi? Um, SkyFi, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. With SkyFi for a bit. And then you, you know, had your consultancy uh, with founder and consultant uh, from Flag and Frontier. And then moved on to just very recently with BombBomb, right? Yeah, just in January. And I was only a consultant yeah. for like two months before BombBomb CMO Steve uh, called me. And so we, that was a little bit of a surprise, but it was a good yeah. surprise. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I can imagine. And then we've had a, a very interesting 2020 to say the least. So all of that kind of uh, kind of led me to think about what you've thought about for many, many years, which is category design, right? So, you know, that, that's kind of what I wanted to dive in. And, and, and I guess if you could just give us a little bit of your, your you know, welcome to the Smart Chickens podcast. It's, it's really all about, um, you know, critical thinking and diverse thinking and how that drives innovation and growth. And I think when, when a person like yourself, John, that has had a pretty diverse background, entrepreneur for sure, um, you know, four years um, kind of uh, cutting your teeth with uh, costly and then building a, a nice customer base, um, all while I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this is where I want to dive in and, and unpack how category design um, helped you shape costly and then we did a little bit on your own with, uh, you know, uh, Flag and Frontier when you were um, a consultant and now with BombBomb. If you can dive into that a little bit also during the show, that would be awesome for our listeners. Yeah, sure. But tell us fun. a little bit about yourself, John. Yeah, sure. So at the moment, I'm uh, professionally, I'm VP of Marketing Strategy at BombBomb, which to be honest, prior to joining, I didn't know that was a marketing title or a job title. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I really focus on, on two things. Uh, one is working with our executive team on how marketing strategy and business strategy align and how we can kind of get to the place that we want to be. And so that's where category design and that discussion kind of comes into play. Other side of my job is I manage our content team and our design team. So all of the um, content you see on our website, on our blog, in our creative you know, sales and marketing collateral, my team handles all of that. So a little bit different side of, of marketing, but um, still very important uh, nonetheless. 
Right. Now, how would you say that sort of uh, you growing up, um, I, I don't know if you did or didn't grow up in Kentucky, Louisville, but I saw that you went to Virginia Tech. You also went to the University of Louisville, Kentucky. Tell us a little bit about kind of your origin story. Uh, got, what got you uh, kind of what, who, you know, bit that bug for entrepreneurship? Was it even before college? You know, I, I'm curious to, to, to deepen, you know, dig, dig into your brain on that a little bit. Yeah, that's a good question. It's not one I get asked a lot on podcasts. So I'll try to make it as interesting as I can, although I, it's, it's, it's not yeah, that You can embellish, but. you know, <laughs> if you like, <laughs> you know, whatever uh, your story is, it's your story, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I grew up mostly in Northern Virginia, outside of DC and okay. then moved to Kentucky in high school. And, uh, you know, really entrepreneurship technology wasn't really on my radar a lot in uh, growing up. I kind of had this idea that I'd be a mechanical engineer. Um, I, I've always just found that kind of work fascinating. So that led me to Virginia Tech and I actually, I studied that for a year. And like a lot of uh, you know freshmen and sophomores in college, I realized, yeah, it sounds, sounds good on paper, but in practice, was it really the, the road I wanted to go down? Um, and so I thought, well, what's, what's, the, what's the opposite of engineering? Uh, and I landed on English, which I hated in high school. I just, yeah. it was like my least favorite subject, but in college, it was a little different. You know, it was more of a focus on critical thinking, less on, you know, writing book reports and that crap. Um, right. but, uh, so, and I, I really enjoyed it and I just stuck with it. And I did, honestly, I didn't know where I wanted to go, what exactly wanted, I wanted to do. I had kind of a vague notion that I wanted to get into business and mm -hmm. I'd always admired Apple and Steve Jobs and what they were doing, even as a kid. Um, but didn't really know what that looked like. I didn't have a lot of, um, like models or, you know, no one in my family was in tech or my dad was in commercial real estate. So different, different industries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I not really sure where that would head. Um, I took a year off, uh, after school with my wife, we hiked the Appalachian trail together since it's been six months going backpacking. And yeah. then, um, Appalachian trail, right? Appalachian trail. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I saw and that then, on LinkedIn too. And I'm like, okay, yeah, there's going to be an interesting story with that for sure. <laughs> right. So you took a year off and with your wife, you guys decided, you know, to kind of, uh, connect with nature and just sort of not even think about, you know, traditionally what's the next step you, you get, you, you're graduating, you got to either do an intern or you're looking at hustling to get into a, uh, kind of like your, your foot in the door. Right. So how, how did you think that cleared your head maybe? for then what happened next into your career? Yeah, you know, I'd like to say that it, I got all these amazing epiphanies and had so much clarity on the, the direction of my life. But the fact is, uh, you know, I was like 22 at the time, 22, and you still, there's so much life experience yeah. you don't have yet. That's and true. so I, th I think for me, it was more of um, uh, giving myself a challenge and, and knowing that the success rate is low, but, um, knowing that you have to, you know, learn patience, perseverance, um, being uncomfortable, comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. like just being able to test those attributes in myself and develop those a little further. Um, those have paid off well later in life. Um, just understanding that not everything has a, a one week payoff. Sometimes you have to wait several months or maybe even years before you can reap the rewards. Um, I think just, kind of wiring my brain with that kind of mindset was really useful. Um, more, more so than like having a direction on my career, because when I left, I took I, all the job advice at the time, this was like early two thousands was like, don't waste your time on job boards, any of those places. Mm -hmm. That's not how people land jobs. So, but they're like, do it anyway, just to see what happens. And if, right. and randomly I, I, put my resume or whatever it was on like monster.com. And like yeah. a week later, I got a job as a financial Back in the analyst. days, monster.com, yeah. career builder. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So this, yeah. Uh, yeah, this company in Louisville that did, did the supply chain for young brands like Taco Bell, Pizza Hut, mm -hmm. hired me as a financial yeah. analyst, which was just a, a way to like enter the business world and get exposed to that. So certainly I've gone a different direction since then, but um, mm -hmm. There's not many people who start off in engineering, study English, and then end up in finance with their first role. But that was that was my path. Yeah, yeah. You you took a you took a, a different path, but but still still has had has uh, resulted in incredible you know journey and results. Because looking at your background and you know Cla Clausley is it was it Cos Cosley, the name yeah. of the company mm -hmm. That's Cosley, right. Yeah. right? That seems very interesting, and and it kind of goes into I think a bit of category design, 
right? And both you and I have an admiration and you've actually even had him on your uh, B2B growth podcast, or I'm not sure which podcast, but it's uh, Christopher Lockhead, you know, one of the co-authors of Play Bigger and Niche Down. Um, so when you think about category design and the magic triangle that we sort of learn about in, in Play Bigger, and you just mentioned Steve Jobs. So some could argue that Steve Jobs was doing category design when it wasn't even called category design in virtue of creating what he created with the iPhone, Apple, the, the pod, you know, the Apple pods and everything else that he's created from it. Right. But tell, tell me what you think, what, what how did it, you absorb that? Yeah. Well, it was interesting. I, I kind of got into category design and learning about it almost as a reaction to some of the challenges I faced at Causely. And so just a little bit of background uh, without taking up your whole show um, at Causely, we help small businesses generate, word of mouth referrals on social media. That was the outcome we focused on. Yep. The way we did that was what was unusual. Um, we incentivized customers to leave reviews and check in on social media um, by donating to causes every time they took those actions. So we kind of, we had a technology platform that allowed that to happen. And then we had kind of a, almost like an agency where we built cause marketing campaigns for customers um, mm -hmm. every, every month throughout the year. And, at the time I wasn't, you know, I wasn't as experienced as a marketer. I knew some things well, but I didn't know other things as well. And we were very focused on, um, you know, performance-based marketing, user acquisition, measuring, um, you know, cost of acquisition, lifetime value, all those things, you know, how can we optimize our Facebook ad campaigns? Very like tactical, yep. down in the weeds. Theory. Yeah. Like hand-to-hand -hand cop ad. Yeah. Yeah. And what I, we, that worked well for, for a while. It almost worked too well. Um, and I say that because sometimes when things work really well, you don't know why they're working or, or mm -hmm. what actually you did that led to that success. Um, and this was when you could advertise on Facebook for compared to today's uh, sure. environment. In terms of the competitive and landscape and, pro and possibly the algorithm changes that they've done and added with all their data scientists over the last, whatever, five years or so, right? Right, so. right. So right. you were able so, to game the system a little bit better back then before their right. IP. Yeah. I mean, we, we were really, we tried to be thoughtful in our creative and our, and our copy, but just the, just the cost of advertising on that platform was less than it was today. Right. And over time that, that started to increase. And we saw that in our business, our cost of acquisition started to go up and up and up. Right. And it's really started to, um, to make growth a challenge for us. We kind of, you know, we were growing at a certain level and it, and it started to flatten out sooner than we would have liked. And so around this time, I started to ask myself, you know, what am I missing? Because marketing is so much more than just putting out campaigns and split testing your way into finding something that yeah. is a lower cost per click. There's, there's more to it than that. So I started to read like a lot of old school marketing books um, that were written before digital marketing, because I wanted a pure perspective on how, how do you build a business outside of like very, these very specific tactics. Like right. what are the more fundamentals? So g give um, us an example of some, something yeah. here. Was like Ogilvy or was it uh, Robert Cialdani's and influence um, then, you know, 19 irrefutable laws of influence, things like that. Or what were some that you kind of dug into? Yeah, there's one, I mean, you can. Yeah, I see there's the books up book behind, behind me. <laughs> uh, there's one that a guy, um, Re uh, Regis McKenna wrote, it's called relationship marketing. Yeah. And he's probably not a name that many people know today, but he was uh, the PR guy for Apple. He worked directly with Steve Jobs. He's fairly well known in Silicon Valley in the 80s and 90s. And, and a lot of what he talked about was how in B2B especially, um, and in technology especially, so much of what happens um, in the buying process occurs outside of interaction with an advertisement or landing page. It ha happens with word of mouth, through relationships, yeah. through press, through coverage all the things that you can't really measure so directly right. um, or, or attribute to, but are very, very important nonetheless. Um, so I, and then I started to read um, books by Al Reese, Jack Trout. And so that, that kind of introduced me to um, this idea of creating a category. So one yeah. of the you know, 22 immutable laws of marketing, number two is if you can't be first in a category, create a new category that you can be first in. Right. And I, when I thought about that, I, I was like, you know, I've never it blows really, your mind, sort of. Yeah, it blew my mind, right? I never thought of like the world in terms of 
you know, in terms of how buyers look at the world through categories and how, how much that matters. And I certainly hadn't thought of the idea of creating a new category. My mindset, and this is kind of what I was taught in the, you know, marketing courses I took in school was like, you need to compete for market share and yeah. talk about how your product is better than something else that's out there. And it dawned on me that when we were at Causely, we didn't have pure competition. Um, and we didn't really, and so our, our buyers didn't have a concept of what we were offering. They didn't have anything to compare it to. Right. But we were approaching all of our messaging and positioning things through that lens of like competition, but not really thinking of how we can tell a better story and really kind of tie that together. Like you could get there in, you know, give it enough time with someone in sales, but it right. was, a, it, we didn't have the right structure to get that message across um, in a more succinct way. And um, so I read that book and I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, James Carberry, who runs uh, Sweetfish Media. Yeah. And I, I told him, you know, just some of the things, you know, I've just talked about and how that blew my mind. And he was like, Hey, well, it, if you're really thinking about this idea of category creation, you need to read this book called play bigger. Yeah. That's, that's Got the, the so gospel. He, it's interesting. So James and yeah, James is on that, that, that same, uh, you know, peak community that, that I belong to in Ethan and, uh, yeah, yeah, sweet fish media, B2B growth podcast, and several other podcasts that, that he helps produce. That's a fantastic. Yeah, I I um I, I see what you're saying. So then that then introduced you even more so to pure category design, the magic triangle. And I presume you started it started resonating and started giving you ideas on how you could shape your messaging and the point of view from the perspective of the customer, how that fell into creating that new category. So how, how did you go about doing that after like you kind of read it and got some, some, you know, epiphanies and some, yeah. some good feedback from the book in, in a way. Right. So it's like a lot of topics, you know, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know and, and need to absorb. And yep. so Jay, I have to give James even more credit because he challenged me that same day. And he said, Hey, I'm going to start, I've been thinking about starting a category creation series on our show on B2B growth. Why don't you okay. host it? And I had like oh, okay. only learned about this concept, you know, weeks previously. He's like, go host a series. So I yeah. said, great, I'll, I'll, love I'll do that. Uh, <laughs> perfect way to learn. So I started yeah. reaching it's out. Best hack. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 you know, started interviewing guys like David Cancel, Bill Mesitis, Mike Volpe, Kit Bodner, all these guys, David Gerhardt, all these guys who had mm -hmm. built categories or been right. exposed to it. Interviewed Christopher Lockhead uh, a couple of times. And I was able to absorb so much. Uh, you know, from those conversations and uh, Christopher in particular was really kind. He's, he's kind of, yeah, he's super he, generous. I agree. And he's definitely, obviously he was one of the co-authors. He lives his, he lives category design and what he did with the companies that he took public back in, 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 you know, and, and through um, they all got acquired through, I think HP uh, over in the West coast, Silicon Valley. But yeah, I agree with you. Interesting that you mentioned David Cancel. So, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, work with uh, Drift as well uh, as a reseller and they're sort of the epitome in recent years, I would say, I don't know, it's arguable, but of that yeah. category design. Uh, for those who don't know, um, describe to the audience what a, you know, like in your terms, what you think category design is. And then also like, what are some of these uh, things like lightning strike, uh, the point of view from the customer's perspective with a magic triangle, you know, what, what you got out of it and what you, how you would describe that to someone who doesn't know what category sure. design is. Let me tell you a couple of things that it's not first because sure. there's a lot of misperceptions, I think, about what mm -hmm. it is. Uh, so it's not about getting an official name, category name on G2 or Gardner. That's not category design. Right. Or Forrester. Uh, or Forrester, <laughs> right. Pick your, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, Pick your it's pay to not, play. <laughs> <right. Analyst. laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's not about um, putting a marketing spin on something that you've already built. Um, in fact, it's, I would argue it's not a marketing strategy at all. It's a business strategy. Right. And so this gets us into the definition. So like we talked about earlier, most companies um, can and maybe even should approach their business and, and, and their strategy in terms of differentiating against competitors, right? You're the leader in the category or you pick a niche you can serve better than anyone else. That's, that's legit. That's not going away. Um, but there's many situations where you want to break free of those constraints, right? So you, you're, you want to um, solve a problem that isn't addressed by a certain category, or right. you want to solve it in a different way than what the market's currently aware of. 
And category design gives you a blueprint to break out of that kind of red ocean strategy and a, a approach a, you know, a different problem or, 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 a, or a develop a different uh, uh, solution Point or a different view, way of solving that problem. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And so it's, it's easier to talk about examples, right? So um, rather than talking about it in principle, because it seems kind of like hand wavy. Like it seems sort of abstract, but then when you throw a, a name that people will recognize like Uber, right? as a category design, or even if we go further back, and I'll let you have some too, but Salesforce yeah. and Mark Benioff, right? right? And, uh, those are examples of true category design as a business strategy. And I, I, gotta, I gotta give you and compliment you, but as you were describing what category design, I had Wikipedia already up with category design and you nailed it. It says here, Wikipedia, according to Wikipedia, category design is a business strategy. So they don't say marketing right? Right. Uh, and discipline that helps companies create, develop, and dominate new categories, products, and services. It's an extends beyond a leadership team's narrower focus on products. It involves, like you said, companies, culture, business models, and they reference, of course, companies like Uber, Airbnb, but they also reference play, play bigger as the book kind of, you know, in Harvard, you know, has done yeah. tons of stuff on category design. Right. So you were right there. You probably helped write this, I guess, for Wikipedia. You contributed in some shape or form. Yeah, I wish I could say that I did. I've got to. Just, just take all the credit. No one will know. No one will check. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead. So you were going to say, so, so some, yeah. what are some others that you would describe yeah. that could help people like uh, put the two together? Sure. So another one that I like is sometimes it's easier to speak to consumer examples because yeah. we're all familiar with those. Tesla is a really good one because- um, sometimes people think category design means um, being first to market. Um, it's not necessarily the case. It can be, um, but it's more about shaping the market in a different direction. And Tesla is such a great example of that because electric cars have been around for over hundred years. They're not new. Um, but the way tech electric cars were perceived by consumers prior to Tesla is that they were, they're basically alternatives to like fuel efficient vehicles, right? Correct. So, there'd be these, you know, gas zippers, three, four cylinder cars. And, and if you really wanted to nerd out and be the guy who's like not using any gas at all, you could yeah. get some like tin box of a car that would go like 45 miles an hour with the, you know, whatever the range is 60 miles down the road. And like, that was, <laughs> that like was it. Like, uh, well, that's a hybrid. The, the, the Prius. This is even, even before <laughs> the Prius, like they were even like before GM, the Prius. <laughs> yeah. Like GM had some electric cars yeah. that, that's that kind true. of fit that bill. And like, yeah. Yeah. So that was the thing. Like they weren't desirable from a performance standpoint. They weren't getting they weren't too many dates with those for sure. No. Right. There's no <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that's right. There's not like that desirability yeah. or, um, you know, and it, that you might get with like a luxury car. So right. uh, like, and then uh, Prius kind of moved that, you know, that, that line of thinking a little bit further with uh, the hybrid car, but still it was like, it was not a car for performance. You sacrifice mm -hmm. tons of performance to get the um, to get the gas mileage. Right. So Tesla flipped that and they said, no, a Tesla, uh, an electric car should not be about sacrificing performance. It should not be about having an uncool car. An electric car should be about increasing performance and having a very, very cool car. And as a bonus, yeah. you get to kind of save the environment or have that conspicuous environmentalism. Yeah. So they reshaped what it meant to be an electric car. They designed that category. They didn't create electric cars, that category, but they designed it and took it in an entirely new different direction. And that's all about what category design is shaping the terms of competition in your favor, rather than just trying to best someone at their own game. Yeah, no, that's a great example. And one that, that I think you're right could resonate with anyone because it's so, you know, B2B, B2B, B2C is not just B2B focused, uh, right. what Tesla's done and Elon Musk and his team. Um, so no, that, that, that's great. So, so then help us understand, maybe you can unpack it a little bit, John. Um, now that you've, you know, uh, had, had your own company as a founder. Uh, so you went through the entrepreneurship journey, uh, with all its, its glory, as well as its pain. Yeah, it sounds like it, it reminds me of, uh, you know, Rand Fishkin, which I love in his lost and founder book, you know, if, uh, he's very poignant on that. Not all the shines is, is gold, right? Um, so even, even you know, companies like Amaz who could have had an early exit with uh, HubSpot who was about to buy, buy them out, they didn't. But he talks right. about, you know, as a founder, you go through kind of the webs and flows of the, the high points and low points. But you had a successful exit, I presume. Then you went on and worked a little bit with uh, SkyFi. Um, 
you know, now that you're at bomb bomb challenges. And I think this is still a challenge now, just a year or so later is that the market, a lot of people don't understand what category design is or what it means um, or how to execute it. Um, there's kind of a notion that like you need to try to be a Salesforce or a Tesla or, you know, a, a unicorn like basically. Uber, for, right. Or yeah. Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's, if that's your aspiration, that might, should be something you look at. But um, for a lot of companies, they're building something that doesn't really fit into a category um, in, in a very clean way. But the way buyers think is, you know, we like shortcuts, right? Our, our mind uses these heuristics to kind of process the world faster. So yeah. we, um, we try, try to like put things in categories we're already familiar with because we can grasp what it is faster. And so for even for smaller companies that don't have these, you know, unicorn aspirations, they have a different approach to something, but they haven't really articulated that well and, and haven't crafted a, a unique narrative around it. Then their buyers are going to try to slot them in with some other category they're already mm -hmm. familiar with. And it really works against them because it's like trying to compare apples and oranges, but their buyers don't know any better. They're just confused and they don't really give those companies the, the attention they need. And I, and I can give you a, a good example of this um, sure. with, with SkyFi. Um, SkyFi started off um, building um, uh, a type of technology. It was, it was basically a guest Wi-Fi software that airports and commercial real estate properties would use. Mm -hmm. It allowed you to kind of control the user experience on your phone when you logged into public Wi-Fi and capture emails and things like that. At the time, that was kind of a new deal, but it wasn't long before that offering became commoditized and yeah. just became whoever can offer it that the cheapest, that's usually who got the deal. Um, behind the scenes, they, Skype had built a much richer platform to give these physical venues analytics and insights about what was happening. And they could tie in all these data sources together and use data science mm -hmm. and all these amazing things. But the market didn't know that they, their perception was uh, it's a Wi-Fi guest Wi-Fi service. Uh, maybe there's a little report or two we get into it, but they didn't have a way to understand what they really offered. Um, and if you ask 12 different people in the company what they did, uh, not to their discredit, but like they'd give you 12 different answers. Sure. And they were all true, but there was no like foundation for that message. And so um, we used the category design process to get clarity on what, what we should actually call this thing. And they ended up using a term called Omnidata Intelligence and that may not have a lot of meaning for you or for the listeners, but that's, it was a conversation starter. It was something that could kind of point the direction for the conversation. So people were familiar with the term intelligence. You've probably heard omni-channel, so you can kind of yeah. get a sense of where it's headed. Yeah. Um, but then the question is, okay, well, what is that? I've not heard of that before. Maybe I have an idea, but tell me more. And now they can have a conversation on their terms to, to explain the problem they're addressing and the, the way they, they solve it rather than saying, Oh, that's, that's uh, that's guest Wi-Fi, right? Like, right. I already have that or, you know, we can get that cheaper somewhere else. So um, change the narrative and it also gave, gives more clarity to the product roadmap and, and the future of the company as well. Right. Well, you know what, you bring up a good point, which is, so if you're seen as a commodity, then it's always going to come down to price for the most part, right? Price or features. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or features, you know, feature benefits versus a narrative of why you're really different. So when you look at, or you think about category design and more holistically, you think of the triangle that, you know, the, the product, the, 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 the customer, and then what the category is, what you're doing different or how you're approaching a different solution to a market yeah. that needs something that they don't even know they need. Right. Um, kind of describe how branding, cause now you, you wear the, uh, the VP marketing hat title, right? So now branding and messaging, um, has to, uh, you know, interplays quite a bit with that, right? So to, to your point about the narrative, right? So, you know, BombBomb's doing a great job at that from what I've seen uh, over the last few years, and you just joined them not, not too long ago. Um, describe how, how, you know, that how branding, messaging, and, and controlling the narrative help with CD design, with category design. And, and what are some, you know, maybe uh, learnings or tips that you could provide for others that, to your point, not everyone's going to be a unicorn, they're the outliers, right? Kind of like the book. Um, for the most part, you know, we're trying to differentiate ourselves, if you will, in a, in a very crowded marketplace, especially, you know, both of you, both you and I are, are sort of in the B2B 
um, sort of B2B SaaS or B2B services space. And it's a very crowded market, as you know, with a lot of technology, uh, different tech stacks out there. But what would you say that would be some good um, tactics, practical tactics on how to level that out and kind of plan it where it's the, the category design as well as the branding messaging? Yeah. What's your experience been like, John? Yeah, this, so the sequence, the order of operations is the most important thing to understand about this. If you start working on the messaging or branding too soon, they're not going to be informed by the right thinking. So the way we went through this at Bomb Bomb is we, um, we start with the problem. What's the problem we're really, really solving with customers? And uh, just, just to give you some more context, not to, not to promote Bomb Bomb, but we allow people to build relationships um, with their customers through personal one-to-one -one video. And yeah. we allow them to do that through, so the, this is asynchronous video, not live video like you and I are talking on Zoom, but recorded video. You can send an email, LinkedIn, Slack, any other Salesforce, any other communication platform you use. And when we looked at the problem, we thought, well, at first, at first glance, we thought, well, opposite of video is text. So text must be the problem, right? No, text mm -hmm. is not the problem. Text is great. We love text. We need text. We don't, you want to vilify something that is really good in, in other contexts. Right. And uh, I won't go through the whole process, but we ended up on this idea that um, our customers, you know, they're typically people in sales or customer success, account management, they are working in a world where their buyers inboxes are filled with spam, with oh, yeah. overly, mar overly automated sequences, phishing mm -hmm. attempts, bots, just all sorts of pollution and they can't tell buyers can't tell what's really worth paying attention to and what's trash. Right. And we're also busy. So our, our inclination is just to ignore mistrust. You even forget a lot of what we read. So bomb Mom solves that problem of your messages being ignored or mistrusted in an inbox. And we happen to do it, you know, through video, through the video messaging, video email. So that problem, you take that problem, that's the foundation for everything that happens with category design. Um, it affects, um, you know, from when, once you've established that, then you need to start working on a narrative for the solution. You can start um, getting better clarity on, on what your product needs to look like. So it's, it's an amazing lens for like, if you know this is a problem you solve, these are the things we should build. And these are the things we don't need to waste our time building because they're, they're solving a different problem. They're taking us right. away from that route route. Um, and you can even, we're starting to get clarity on who our best target markets are right now. So <clears throat> we were able, because we have that clarity on the problem, we can ask different segments, how strongly they respond to that problem, how much pain they feel from it. And that's a leading indicator to us of how successful we'll be in that market. We don't have to say right. anything about our product, but we can say, hey, here's this problem that we think you might have. Tell us what you think. And that's a, such a strong data point to figuring out who to go after. Now, it sounds so basic, but it does get, uh, obviously, there, there's some complexity behind that. But what I love what you just said right now is that you, you know, in category design and what you've done with Bomb, Bomb and other companies, I'm sure, is that you, you use a soundboard, right? So after you get your true north, which is what problem are we solving, right? How can we really, really solve that problem? And maybe we have a unique way to look at it, but through the lens of the customer who wants to receive that solution, then how often or when is it appropriate during category design um, to actually look at either those, those surveys, the type form surveys, or the, the outreach to your, you know, the 80-20 rule. So if you've got, you know, 80% of your, or your revenue is coming from that 20% sort of your super user group, do you mm -hmm. reach out to them? Do you reach out to closed lost? Um, to even see like why they didn't choose, you know, a bomb bomb or X, Y, Z company that's trying to really be known for a category design. If, if you don't mind, how, how does that process work? Or what do you think that you've seen work or don't work in terms of getting to that, you know, that getting that message real clear and understanding from that message, from that soundboard, how to build that roadmap to your product or solution? Sure. So a lot of it's going to depend on where you are as a company and whether you have an established customer base or whether you're just starting out. For us, we had a, a fairly established customer base, um, tens of thousands of paying customers that we could draw from. So we started with that research and we, we asked questions like, you know, what problem did you hire BombBomb to solve? Uh, your questions of that nature. 
And just reading through, it, it wasn't like a quantitative type of research. It was just reading through the responses, kind of letting them wash over you and seeing what kind of, of, of themes emerge. Um, right. So that was a big, big data point. Um, another piece that we did and we're continuing to do is we've, we spent a lot of time talking to our sales teams and our customer success teams and our customer support teams. Again, understand when they're on those calls, what are their expectations um, for successful customers? What are they, you know, what's the outcome that they're happy with? What are they trying to accomplish? And if you get those, th those data points together, um, you know, interviews with your team, feedback from your customers, that's going to get you pretty far. Um, it's not, I, I should say this is, it's not an exercise where your customers will give you the answer directly. They're not going to hand it to you. Right. It's your job to really explore it. Right. And, and, uh, we came up with, um, kind of nine criteria. We wanted our problem definition to meet and, so, sometimes we had an idea that we were really excited about, like, this is it, this is it. And then we'd put it against those criteria and we said, no, wow. it's just not really, it's like too surface level. It's not getting the meat of the problem. Um, it's not a problem we can solve. It's too abstract. There's, like I said, there were nine criteria, but. Um, Interesting. I mean, do you mind sharing a bit of those? You don't have to give all nine. We don't want to give away your secret formula or sauce. But when I think about what you just said, I think, you know, sort of the process of creating a unique value proposition. The very superficial, uh, you know, mm. kind of method behind that is a bit of reaching out to first, you know, first, first, secondary and tertiary kind of data sources. So your customer base through, through questionnaires or user groups, uh, mm. and then a little bit of whatever the market data kind of gives you, right? Kind of a little broader, and then maybe getting into, you know, you know, uh, lost, you know, what closed lost or, kind of uh, scenarios where you're saying, okay, we lost out. Why? Why did they go to the competitor? Is, uh, is that sort of the part of it with the backdrop of those nine points of the criteria? Yeah. So I, I can give you a couple of them. I don't have it in sure. front of me, but I, I can remember a few of them. So one is um, you never want to vilify something that is really good in other contexts. And I think we spoke to this earlier. We thought text was the problem. Yeah. Text, you can't really make text a villain. It's a really great thing. So we knew it had to go deeper than that. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, it has to be a problem that your customers actually feel sufficient pain from. So it has to be, um, it can't be like your problem or, or some other person's problem. It has to be your customer's problem and they have to face significant pain from it. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it needs to be a problem you can solve and in a, in a, in a meaningful way. Um, let's see, it's, uh, I think another one was like, it has to be one where like, they're on existing solutions to the problem today. Right. And that, that one's really key because if there are other solutions, it's hard to make the argument that you're really going down the category design path. You're, you may have a better solution than other approaches out there, which is fine, but. Uh, Got it. You're not really pushing the envelope. Yeah. Got it. You're not pushing the envelope so far that it, you're creating a new category. You might just be competing on a better feature set of that you know, whatever that widget, that software. Um, interesting that you say that. And, you know, speaking a little bit of, of Christopher Lockhead, he, he recently put on, on one of his posts something along like, um, you know, either are you marketing or are you creating a following or are or, or you creating an, an advocacy or a community? Mm -hmm. Kind of that was sort of the messaging if I read between the lines. In other words, you know, we could all do marketing with all the tech stack that's available to us more so than ever now, probably, right? But when thinking about, to your point, category design and that criteria, you know, you know what, what kind of community, um, and I know that that word gets overused in our space, like, yeah. you know, build a community or else you're just a commodity. That's, uh, by the way, Sangram from Terminus, that's one of his little, yeah. his quotes. And I, I kind of believe it, but, but then people might get confused and say, oh, well, so does category design mean that I should create the community first? And when, we, when I think a little bit about Drift as an example, and you've interviewed Dave Cancel, and I've heard him quite enough on podcasts um, in, in the past, that you know, they sort of felt that they were creating a niche category design around conversational marketing, the AI chatbots. Um, it's not that they were the first, you know, to your point. Um, in fact, HubSpot, where they both came from, Elias and, 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 um, Dave, and Dave, had already a chatbot built into their, their platform but they didn't just focus on the chat bot, HubSpot, right? right. They, they have a bigger offering, a 
much more complex all-in-one type platform and that wasn't their niche right so they started building purposely you know you've got a colleague um in uh dave gerdhart which i know you've you've had a pleasure i think of interviewing him as well i think um you know dg also started building a community quite a bit purposely intentfully how much of that would you say plays into sort of that roll out of category design like having you know a purpose purpose driven you know outreach marketing community building type campaign behind the brand and behind your your solution of, of your new category yeah i think any brand would love to have a a strong, you know, raving community behind them. Um, but to your question earlier about like, do you build a community first or how does that follow? I, uh, I believe that the community has to come from uh, values first is that's why people join a community to usually reinforce some value that they aspire to or to create a self of, you know, a sense of identity. And, uh, so if you're trying to build a community on top of that, um, it's a little harder you know, maybe you can build it around, you know, just a user group uh, around the functionality and teaching people how to use your software, but that's not really community. It's just, that's more tactical. Right. Um, and so that's, that's something that we're trying to capitalize on at BombBomb. Bomb. Um, as you, you'll, we're going to talk more about our category here in the next few months, but one of the values that we're going to start talking about very heavily is the idea that um, humans, um, humans matter in terms of communication humans need to interact with other other humans and the more that we abstract that or put um you know bots or automations in front of ourselves or create kind of these artificial ways of reaching out the the further we we pull people away from each other and um but we know that like humans are critical to developing relationships so we want to celebrate how successful communication is built on humans and and uh, yeah i I, like, I like that approach i see what you're saying like bring it back down to something that's not just technology but it's really about that that interaction and i would say to be honest with you that more than ever because of what our new normal has been because of 2020 and the pandemic that that feeling of connection whether it's what we're doing right now which is obviously a, a, a it's not asynchronous but we have this uh, recorded video and it is live um that that's something we we all just in our innate in our dna we we want to still continue to have so when you have a solution like bomb bomb that helps that uh with your client base that i know run the gamut from auto dealerships um you know to 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 uh, real estate uh big uh, conglomerates and and other types of uh you know verticals that makes sense right people still need to talk from you know one human needs to talk to another um that visual contact i think is important more than ever because of the fact that we don't necessarily have the same type of conferences, uh, road shows that we would have in Q3, Q4 to go to. So um, I, I like how you guys are approaching that. Um, I know that you did a little bit and I, I maybe did like a, a snudge of, of collaboration. You were helping G2 Crowd, I think, write a paper on that, right? Or they were going to come out with a bit of a series. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so I, I wrote a piece. It's called The uh, Newcomer's Guide to Category Design. Um, it's written a lot from my own experience, a lot from the interviews that I've done. And then I had several contributors and I think, you know, you're one of them uh, yourself uh, who added their own thoughts um, to the, to the document. So it's designed to kind of bridge the gap between play bigger, which is a very kind of um, deep uh, look at, at the process and why it matters. Yep. Uh, and someone who knows very little about it um, or just has read it, maybe an article about category design. So it's designed to kind of help you understand if category design is right for you, um, how to get your team um, talking about it, how to discuss it with your CEO or your leadership team, um, and then ha- kind of a high level overview of what that process looks like. Um, we're going to publish it um, this fall. We're still working on the exact dates, but uh, Christopher Lockett was kind enough to write the forward, which I was really stoked about. That's so. awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. And congratulations on that. And I'll tell you what. Prior to doing this interview, I did a little research and literally just Googled category design and how to write different types of, of queries and nothing really solid came back. Like Wikipedia describes it and references the right people and like in the right books uh, and a decent definition, the, you know, the, the, the business definition for it. But in terms of if you were to go to Google right now, like I just did a, you know, 15 minutes before getting on this call with you, John, 
it, I had to put examples of category design. You know what came back? A lot of it came back is like design, like graphic design. So the confusion of category design in itself, if I put category design, maybe I'll get something more close to that. But when I put B2B category design examples, because I wanted to see if there's any new ones that happened in, you know, since 2016, you could start already seeing some articles on it. Uh, but, you know, 2019, this year has been a bit blurry, 2020. So I don't know how many people have dove into that per se, but that's awesome that you're doing that and, and sending it out. Hopefully, you know, we start getting, you, get, you guys start getting picked up by the algorithm. Uh, by Google's algorithm and, and are able to start getting more info around category design. Because in the community that I'm with, with, with your colleague, Ethan, um, and others, and James, um, I've been approached a bit about category design, and I'm no, and I'm no expert. In fact, I, I brought up John Lockhead, you know, and I'm going to bring you up uh, to those people that are, that are asking questions. But I'm a curious cat, so I like to learn uh, by doing as well as by other, you know, interviewing others like yourself. Uh, but yeah, that, that's important. I think that it's, it's sort of timely, I would say, because some of the folks that I've heard also on other podcasts, um, like Christopher Lockheads, as an example, you know, a lot of them are going to and talking to VCs, as an example, that are thinking of, okay, they're, they're doing this sort of like uh, backcasting. They're trying to put what could potentially we look like three years or four years into a post-COVID-19, whatever that is, right? Maybe the pendulum swings back and we're in a better state where we don't have to have everything be remote and everything be via Zoom, right? Zoom probably won't like that, you know? <laughs> they're, they're loving their stock and their IPO that just happened uh, earlier this year. But let's say we don't, the pendulum does go back and it's like a hybrid of 60% people can go back to the office, the other 40, you know, Twitter has to re redo another tweet and say, nope, guess what? Not everyone can work remote forever. Now we're actually gonna let you start getting back, right? Who knows? But the one thing that could differentiate these innovators that's, that traditionally happen when there's these sort of awkward recessionary, uh, you know, times in our economies like we're going through right now, it's when you have these innovators that come out and think very much like category design. They start looking with a lens of, okay, there's already a plethora of XYZ out there, but maybe someone hasn't seen it from this angle. And I want to go, you know, 110% on how do I help solve that, you know, that niche uh, you know, uh, pain uh, through category design and creating a new XYZ. Is that sort of what you guys are thinking about as well? Um, you know, when, when, when you were thinking about writing this in terms of what's also happening with, you know, the big, the, the, the big elephant in the room, right? The, the pink elephant in the room is, is, it is what it is. So what, what are your thoughts or opinions on that? On like specifically on whether COVID is going to. Yeah. Like is that bit of, I mean, we're, yeah, we know it's been an accelerator for some industry. Like, like we think about telehealth. Yeah. Telemedicine has been around for maybe 20 years. The last 10 years, maybe they were starting to get momentum. But C19 hit and way, you know, Teladoc, um, any, any telemedicine company that was sort of positioning to grow did. Some got acquired. Yeah. You know, some maybe, maybe got lost. But for the most part, they've all done well. Same, I would say, to SaaS companies. People that were out of digital transformation and thought it was a buzzword. You know, now sales companies need you know, uh, Zoom, it's not a nice to have, they need um, a bomb bomb, they need, they need engagement tools to help them sell in this new, you know, uh, new, new kind of way of, of doing business. So do you see that being part of the equation? Yeah, I think the more the world changes, the more opportunities there are for category design thinking. Because as the world changes, circumstances change, new problems arise, the nature of problems changes. And that's where category design thinking comes into play. Um, if the world was static, I'm sure we'd still come up with category design opportunities. But I mean, it, I mean, you think about what we do. If we, if we launched BombBomb Bomb, you know, a long time ago or too too far ago, we would it, it would be more like a nice to have rather than like a, a real pain solver. Because if you got a message from somebody, you're you're probably going to open it. You probably knew that it was from another person, and you'd have. Right. 700 emails in your inbox every day. Um, and we've also, we looking forward, like we know that this problem is going to evolve and there's going to be new challenges like phishing attempts. And now the reverse of the problem where I think this is someone I should trust, but really it's, I shouldn't, I shouldn't trust them. So how do I, for, and for a lot of industries, like you think about um, phishing attempts or how much mm -hmm. um, uh, like a data breach can cost someone. Um, 
that's, that's going to be a huge challenge for a business. Like how do I verify that this is really the person that is sending this message and how do I do that across my organization? That's a problem that's really yet to be solved. But like with our category lens, we know that that's an area that we can head. So yeah, I think this is a great time for category design thinking because every year our world changes at a just, just a faster pace yeah. and all those changes present new problems that you can't anticipate. And it's, it's a way yeah, that- no, that's, that's well said. I mean, I think you're right. Um, change, which is probably the true constant in our, in our times, it is a, um, you know, it's kind of like a evergreen pasture for CD thinking and CD design, right? So I agree with you. And I think that I, I, would, I would argue a little bit that uh, for, those, for those folks that think it's too late to start thinking category design, uh, it's not. Um, to your point, and I like that you stressed it, not everyone has to think that category design equates with unicorn status, that you've got to create the next Uber through category design. Um, you know, it, that's a nice outcome that can happen, you know, if everything's aligned properly, right. all the stars are aligned and you, that you become the next Airbnb in your space. But, but you can still take CD um, principles from th those that you described, your criteria, which I, I'm glad you were able to share a bit of that with us without getting too much into like an NDA situation <laughs> at BombBomb. Bomb. Um, I think they'll appreciate that, the folks that have been asking me about CD, myself included. Um, you know, so I, I wanted to shift gears a little bit because I know we've talked a, right, a lot about category design, which, which I know you enjoy and love and I do as well to talk about. But getting back to the, the human, going back to the human that you and BombBomb Bomb are trying to pull, pull out of your solution. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about, you know, how you've spent the last, you know, uh, nine, 10 months navigating through these uncharted waters. Um, I know you're a family man as well, you know, and uh, I'm nowhere near uh, as many children as you. I believe you said you told me once you have four daughters. Yeah, so, yeah four daughters. Yeah, four daughters. Yeah. Okay, so how has it been? Because I, I work from home and a working parents, and it might be two working parents, you and your wife. How has that been over the last, uh, you know, six six months or so? I, did you hear my three year old that said the yeah, day? I did. Earlier? No worries. I was going to ask you, did you hear my three or six year old? Because I have them yeah. supposedly quietly watching a movie with my wife, but you know, at any time yeah. they could scream. So I don't know. Right. You know, I, I just think about how, uh, how blessed I am, Johnny, and how you and I are to be in a situation where we can work from home, we can do our job successfully, we can be near our families, and we're, we're able to do what we do and provide for everyone. Because a lot of uh, people around the world, they're not in that situation. They don't have that blessing and just no, no fault of their own. That's just, that's just the way it is. Um, and so I just think about how fortunate I am to be in a place where we have technologies like this. I can work from home and um, do what I do. So, yeah. as as Alcillus from Christopher Lockhead would say, "Amen, Hallelujah!" And and you're right, brother. That is so true. We are blessed. Not everyone that's in this pandemic, and I have family overseas um, in in Ecuador, South America, in in Canada, in Spain, and so I I I 100% agree, and it resonates what you're saying. We are blessed that we're in this sort of we're part of the knowledge economy where we were quickly able to shift gears into doing this and making this our, our livelihood um, sort of interrupted, but not, not, not severed. Right? right. So I agree with you. Um, and it's good to count our blessings and to look at the silver linings that we were able to spend more time with our children. You know, I got to do uh, a little bit of, of, of being a, a, a semi tutor to my son during, during, during his virtual uh, end of second, uh, end of kindergarten and now into his first grade. So, okay. I mean, I'm sure that that resonates with you, maybe in your wife. Um, interesting uh, to, to say the least uh, th these times, um, but but definitely I, I'm a half glass full kind of guy anyhow. So I, that's the way I would probably have looked at it any at, you know given the situation. But so now get you know we do a little bit of a quick fire and I like to have fun a little bit with my guest uh, about you know if, if you were to jump on I, I'm in my 40s the fourth floor so a, a big uh, franchise that I grew up with loving to watch was you know. Um, uh, Mr. Michael J. Fox and Marty and Back to the Future, right? So if you were to come in at the DeLorean with us, right, John, and, and you're with Marty, and you, you put that uh, to uh, 1999 or whatever, you go back to a younger John <laughs> before Virginia Tech maybe or the Appalachian Mountains, <laughs> yeah. what would you tell yourself uh, to do maybe either different or to focus on, if anything, you could do nothing and not interrupt the time continuum, as uh, Doc would say. <laughs> you got to be careful. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I, I think I'd interrupt the time continuum a little bit. I'd, I think I tell myself to uh, expose myself to more things earlier on because you only, you know, wherever you live in, that's what you, or wherever you grow up, that's what you know. And there's a lot of that. That's, you know, 1% of 1% of the world. And so um, exposing yourself to more things and just putting yourself in positions to experience new things and see new opportunities and paths in life, the earlier you can do that, the better. And um, I wish I had kind of learned that lesson a little earlier because I think it would have um, just changed the, the way I approach life. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. It reminds me of Tim Ferriss mentioning that a little bit too. He called himself a human guinea pig for, for that same yeah. reason. <laughs> He kind of wanted to always explore and wished he could even explore more in in his early 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 years. But no, that's great great input, feedback, and and, and potentially advice. Because when I when I think about this, I think about listeners that are maybe in in you know in in their towards the end of their college degree and college years, looking at how they're going to go into a um, into a new field during this sort of pandemic and recessionary environment that we're in. Um, you know, I, I, I actually, a, a show before this one, I interviewed uh, an ex-colleague of mine, Millennial, that I sort of mentored. And I was with a big uh, automotive company um, doing content marketing. But, you know, he missed it by this much. It, he got hired in January. Had he not got hired in January, I feel for him. Because I think that, you know, not everyone has been fortunate like yourself and I to just sort of get a little bump in the road and keep going. So I appreciate you saying that because I think it'll, it'll, it'll resonate for, for someone who... Um, is thinking, how can I accomplish what John's accomplished and, and how, what, what you, know, you would have told your younger John. So that's awesome. Now, going back to uh, you know, education, because I think that um, you know, uh, readers are leaders and you definitely are one. What are some book recommendations that you would give, give our listeners? Maybe your top two or three that yeah. you think might be good for them to read. Yeah, sure. There's one that I've reread a couple of times now and I've, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface of the value I can get from it. But uh, it's never split the difference. Um, Very good. Which, book. Yeah. And so for anyone who's not read it, it's written by the lead or former lead ho- hostage negotiator, international hostage negotiator for the uh, FBI. And it's not what you think about like how to, you know, manipulate someone in, in to get into doing something. <laughs> Please don't jump. <laughs> right. Please don't designate yourself. Yeah. It's, it's right. more like negotiating to not uh, go ahead. You tell it. Cause I, I yeah. know we're, yeah, it's about this idea, he calls it tactile empathy, and it's just about helping the other person feel like they're understood and uh, working through problems that way. And you know, he comes from that world, that hostage negotiation world, but so much of what he, he uh, teaches, it's great for business, it's great for uh, personal life, like working with your spouse, your children, your friends. It's just a very, um, it's the kind of negotiation you can feel good about. And um, yeah, and I've, I could read it 10 times and still not, get everything else I need to get out of it. Um, Number two, I'll go with an old school one. Um, (laughs) If you can find it, it's called Marketing High Technology and it is written by a former exec at uh, at Intel. And there's this big takeaway in the book about how the job of marketers is not to um, sell uh, devices, but it's to sell products. There's a, and for Intel, a a chip is a device, a product is all the things that go around it and make someone successful. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of premise of the book. And he goes into stories behind that. That line of thinking is great for any marketer. That's excellent. Well, no, that's great. And uh, another couple of the quick fires, you know, um, how many hours of sleep um, are you routinely getting? You look like you're, you're pretty good, in pretty good shape. I don't know if you're mountain climbing again, but uh, Appalachian mountain tracking, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> how many hours do you get to get sleep at night? Uh, seven and a half. That's great, man. 10 to 530. And, uh, that's good. And then what, what do you see right now as maybe a, kind of a, I wouldn't say a hack, but a technology tool or something that helps you get through, through the day, the month with you or your team? What, what, have, what are you using that, that might be a, a good one for, for people to know? Mm. Well, I've, I've been a, uh, into meditation for a long time, and I've found that, that is, um, it's such a great way to kind of clear your mind especially in the middle of the day. And so um, there's, there's a couple apps you can use. Headspace is one mm-hmm. um, if, you're, if you're new to it. Um, but you don't have to be some meditation expert. It's not about being a guru or anything like that. It's just about you know, training your mind to recognize uh, distractions and, and allowing you to focus and, and really pay attention to what you need to pay attention to. And so 
um, that's not something you can maybe do so much as a team, but it's really helped me um, kind of get throughout the day and uh, get through the week. Yes. Though for those that don't have four children, uh, four daughters at home with different ages from three to 12, you think, would you say? Uh, three to nine. Th- yeah. Three to nine. Three, Sorry. Five, so, seven, nine. Yeah. yeah. So meditation and yoga, I, I totally can feel you with that for Headspace. Uh, in fact, we had a guest on uh, Brian Smith. He's the founder of a company called MyLeon.co. Um, it's all about wellness and, 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 and Headspace is one of the partners that they have. Um, it's a help burnout, which as you know, okay. working in B2B with marketing and sales, it can happen, right? Quite easily. Yeah. So um, no, that is great. And thanks for sharing that with us. And then uh, the, the last one is, you know, uh, what, 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 what did I not ask you that maybe you wanted to, to discuss, if anything? Was there something that might be something you want to talk about, mention, plug? It's okay. You can plug Bomb Bomb or whatever. That this is a good time. <laughs> we talked about Bomb Bomb quite a bit already. So what's one thing that I wish you had asked about? Um, ooh, that's, that's a good one. That's the first time I've been asked that question on the podcast, Gianni. Um, I'll, maybe I'll ask you a question then. What do you think marketing is going to look like in five years? Man, I'll tell you what, I'm going to have, hopefully, um, <laughs> so it's, it's a loaded question, but I, I'm going to have Scott Brinker, uh, the ecosystem platform VP <laughs> in November. And you've seen the, 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 the Pangea diagram that he always posts about how exponentially we're working with MarTech and it's growing. I, I, I honestly think that, I think it in a weird way, John, I think we're going to go back to what you guys are trying to do, which is the humanized. So we're, we're so right now data-driven. There's so much AI. There's so much MarTech stack and so much technology that it seems somewhat overwhelming. And it, they, they seem to, a lot, a lot of them seem to overlap. So I think we're sort of losing our focus on the human relationship, the human touch, the, the empathy, the human behind all the tech. So I think that the winners in marketing slash, like strategic marketing, yeah. right? So the ones that are helping drive revenue, which is how it should always be. Um, are those that are going to somehow find the magic formula and are working to find that magic formula that humanizes that experience again. So uh, that's sort of my take on it. I think we're going to have to go backwards a little bit, focus back on the human element, and then layer in the, the magic, you know, pixel dust of technology and AI without losing sight of that. Because I think if we lose sight of that. I think it's, it, it, it starts getting a little bit um, robotic and awkward. Mm-hmm. Uh, for B2B marketing or any marketing, quite frankly. Right. So. Yeah. If you like technology, get in the way of you know, real marketing, which is connecting yeah. with people and um, helping them solve problems, then you've got it backwards. But that's how a lot of us do it today. Exactly. Exactly. No more sequence emails, please. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting a lot of those. It's Q3 ended and then I got a ton of them. Now Q4 started and everyone's like, let's double down on that so we can get that last bit of budget. Let's squeeze that email juice, right? So no, that, that's, that's great advice you're giving too. So I appreciate it. Look, it's been a lot of fun. I wish we had even more time to, to, to chat, but I want to respect you and your family's time. And uh, I will post notes uh, for sure about the book recommendations. If someone wants to reach you, John, um, to learn more about uh, BombBomb and or category design, where can they find you? Sure. Well, bombbomb.com is pretty straightforward. Um, I have a blog about category design. It's flagandfrontier.com. You can check that out. Uh, there's a category design newsletter you can subscribe to and you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you'll probably have to look at the show notes to how to, for how to spell my last name. But if you search for John bomb mom, I'll probably come up. How do you pronounce your last name? It's, I know it's a little French, right? Yeah, it's, it's French, French, but we've Americanized it. It's uh Rougie. Rougie. Okay. Instead of Rougie, yeah. Jean yeah. Rougie, maybe, right? <laughs> right. So, yeah. So no, this has been great. I really appreciate it. Um, all the best uh, with Bomb Bomb and with your category design uh, paper. Definitely ping me when that comes out, the series. I'd love to have a read. Um, I'm sure that it'll be very insightful. So again, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Gianni. Uh, appreciate you having me on. It was a pleasure talking with you. Been a pleasure.